Good afternoon. I'm Greg Nichols, a subject matter expert with the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center. I'm joined today by my colleague and fellow HDIX me, Joel Hewitt. We'll be discussing our findings from the 2018 State of the Art Report on Department of Defense considerations for disaster response. And we want, would like to welcome you to our webinar. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, slides and the State of the Art Report will be available for download at the end of this presentation. The full webinar will be available tomorrow on our website and on social media. And we will have the chat function enabled throughout the webinar. Uh, for any questions you may have, uh, Joel and I will get to those at the end. We should have about 10 or 15 minutes for a discussion. So the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, is one of three Department of Defense Information Analysis Centers. We sit within the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering and report up through the Defense Technical Information Center. We're responsible for acquiring, analyzing, and disseminating relevant scientific and technical information across eight different focus areas in support of the U.S. Department of Defense and other government research and development activities. Our mission is to be the go-to R&D, S&T, and rdt and &E leader within the Homeland Defense and Security community. We achieve this by providing timely and relevant information, superior technological solutions, and quality products to the DoD and HDS, COIs, and COPs. HDI develops annual state-of-the-art reports on scientific technical topics that are highly relevant to DoD. And we'll talk more on the next slide while we chose disaster response for this year. So we paired original research that Greg and I and other colleagues here at the HDIAC BCO conducted regarding the leading issues, topics, and challenges related to disaster response. From there, we elicited contributions from leading external subject matter experts, arriving at seven primary chapters in our state-of-the-art report. Our authors for this report included researchers from private industry, academia, national laboratories, independent consultants, as well as our own HDI experts. So why do we choose disaster response? Well, 2017 was an unprecedented year for disasters. There were 16 events, each with a cost or a damage of greater than $1 billion. In fact, 2016, 17, and now 2018 rank among the top four years for the worst disasters in US history. Second, the most recent national security strategy released in December of 2017 highlights disaster response as critical to homeland defense. The report states that the U.S. must take steps to respond quickly to meet the needs of the American people in the event of national disaster or attack on our homeland, as well as provide our expertise and capabilities to those in need during disaster events abroad. Since 2011, DOD has provided assistance for several significant disasters most notably Operation Tomodachi in response to the Tohoku earthquake in Japan, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident in 2011. 2014, U.S. forces responded to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. And in 2017, uh, U.S. forces spearheaded by DOD and the Defense Logistics Agency responded to hurricane relief efforts in the wake of Hurricane Maria, primarily in Puerto Rico. And finally, the concept and practice of disaster response aligns with at least five of HDIX focus areas, including critical infrastructure protection, CBR and defense, cultural studies, homeland defense and security, and medical. And one quick mention, Joel and I have actually had the opportunity to be part of a few long-term recovery efforts following some large catastrophic events. Joel was able to respond um, for long-term efforts following the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010 and I was able to uh, be part of long-term recovery efforts in Rome County, Tennessee, following the Tennessee Valley Authority Kingston Fossil Plant coal ash spill in 2008. So these technology categories and the improved disaster response outcomes that they engender are derived from our overarching analysis of the state of the field. Each of these bears upon the confluence of concepts relevant to DOD, disaster or emergency response writ large, and science and technology. Not all technology categories are addressed in each chapter, but each contributes heavily to multiple sections. 
As a generalized example of this, take social media. The use of social media applications or functions like Facebook's safety check feature has allowed first responders and disaster management planners to tap into the power of crowdsourcing. Similar to how Twitter was used in the wake of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, this use of social media allows for the more efficient use of resources and improves situational awareness during an event. The outline of this presentation follows the order of the chapters in the report. The reason that we picked this order was to try to mimic the flow of a typical response. The state of the art report addresses six areas in which scientific and technical research and development are most likely to intersect with improving disaster response practices relevant to DOD and also relevant to defending the homeland. We'll begin with communications management, which is divided into risk and crisis communications and social media technologies, followed by the additional um, topics that we display here. And the last section will cover a very special topic of how to respond to radiation emergencies. So achieving what is known as a communication success during an emergency event is critical to the overall success of a response to a disaster. Communicating event relevant information swiftly and accurately during a disaster creates an environment based on trust and credibility, builds confidence in public officials, and helps to produce an informed audience that is attentive and solutions oriented during the event. Risk or crisis communication in turn has two congruent functions. First, to calm stakeholders' fears and anxieties and empower them to react. And two, to pique stakeholders' interest to listen thoughtfully and acquire that actionable information to protect themselves and their property. As the table shows, and as the SOAR expands on this topic significantly, this field is built around four core theories or principles insights from which help guide how DOD and civilian agencies like DHS should structure their risk and crisis communications. This includes the recommendation that disaster communications should, quote, show that you care. And while this may seem out of place for a technical study, other studies have shown that indeed crisis messages that display empathy increase citizen buy-in and action in response to a risk message. An effective communication response strategy includes, one, planning and development, or the pre-placement of policies, procedures, equipment, and even rehearsals or exercises. Two, taking discrete steps to develop trust and credibility in the citizenry. And this includes considering even nonverbal communications, like the subtle messages that explanatory figures or logos can convey. And three, putting all of that into action. Staying effective and keeping communication issues to a minimum when responding to the unpredictability of an event. So DOD's risk lifecycle follows this general model. DOD's role in risk and crisis communication on the local, state, or territorial level is to supplement and enhance existing communication processes for stakeholders. Regardless of incident type, the communication lifecycle determines what resources are needed the level of effort necessary to deploy them, and the staffing needed to implement a risk and crisis communication plan. So related to risk and crisis communication comes the somewhat dark horse social media technologies. Um, I think at one point with the advent of the internet and definitely social media, no one could have imagined the role that social media would play in disaster response. So beginning in 2005, uh, Facebook was less than one year old and one of the largest disasters the U.S. has ever experienced, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, social media played very little role in that disaster from response or from a, a personal um, posting uh, standpoint. 2017, following the Virginia Tech mass shooting, um, we had iPhones, so we had camera phones, Twitter had been developed, so we saw a little bit more of a role than social media played in that that response. However, in 2012 with Hurricane Sandy, this is really where social media saw the breakthrough in terms of how it was used in disaster response, not just among first responders and emergency managers, but also among uh, the victims in, the, in that disaster. 
So for example, 3.2 million tweets used hashtag Sandy and they were sent within the first 24 hours of the um, incident. And during the first week of the disaster, 11 million tweets were sent. One of the challenges that we see with social media, however, whether it's a disaster or not, is um, how we counter and how we prevent the spread of false information. And this is one of those challenges that links back to risk and crisis communications that Joel discussed on the previous slide. So going forward, you know, what can we expect to see out of uh, social media? And we noticed three emerging trends, uh, looking at artificial intelligence, the use of the Internet of Things in conjunction with social media, and also how we can integrate blockchain into the um, we're going to focus on machine learning and artificial intelligence because that seems to, to be where most of the technologies are currently developing. If you look at the figure on the left, um, this explains a platform known as artificial intelligence for digital response. What this could do is this can pour through uh, social media channels and tweets and other things like that and actually create maps of uh, what's happening in different locations in real time. So obviously this could be a great aid to uh, first responders and other people in a disaster who may need to know what's happening. If you look on the right, um, these are some images that were actually created with um, artificial intelligence pouring through uh, data from Twitter and Flickr. And this was actually able to identify flooded areas. And this comes from the Col Colorado floods in 2013. Um, this technique was actually quicker and was more reliable than satellite imagery. And so going forward, this could be a way for first responders to identify areas of need much faster than relying on traditional satellite images. So on this slide and the next, we're discussing the fourth chapter in the SOAR, which is aptly named Drowning in Data. Mitigating Data Overload and Disaster Response. And the title alone makes two significant points. First, data is the common denominator across all types and phases of disaster response operations. Second, advances in computing and especially mobile devices threaten to overwhelm responders with a tsunami of data, all of it seemingly relevant. The slide displays the five primary types of data that are most commonly applied in disaster response activities. And as mentioned before, crowdsourcing and social media-based info is an increasingly important and volumetric category. In combination with more traditional data types, such as publicly accessible or government data, these add up to more than just the sum of their parts. Specifically, three classes of data types are newer or emerging still into the disaster response scene. These include first, machine learning or intelligence. For example, a team for California Polytechnic State University at San Luis Obispo developed a machine learning system to identify types of post-earthquake structural damage from images, many of them harvested directly from social media streams. Crowd computing as well. Perhaps most notable was the use of an automated website after the appearance of Malaysia Airlines 370 in 2014. And the website allowed users to visually search boxes of satellite imagery of the nearby ocean in the ultimately futile search for floating debris. In visual analytics, the field of imaging science, which combines multiple technologies, allows responders to identify and be aware of otherwise hidden hazards. In conclusion for this chapter in the SOAR, with the use of new technologies aside, the key to mitigating data overload during incidents is to create and maintain a culture of data literacy within disaster response community. So the next chapter focuses on responder protection. And this was such an important chapter and it contains so much information that the next three slides will focus on various aspects of of how to protect first responders. This has become a very important topic ever since uh, the attacks on September 11th and primarily because of uh, the response to the World Trade Center. And so, you know, a lot of traditional gear in terms of firefighting, special operations, and hazmat hasn't really changed much. Um, we still have some basic challenges. A lot of it uh, revolves around adaptability and usability, 
having um, one type of clothing or gear that could be used for multiple uh, purposes, and, and that seems to be a challenge. So looking at it into terms of future development, um, this convertibility in terms of garments and gear is, is one of the things that uh, researchers tend to be focusing on. Another challenge in, in general, and many of you on the webinar will be familiar with this, whether you've worn uh, level A um, gear, or whether you've worn mop gear or anything like that, um, it's, it's understanding um, heat stress and heat management. Any of these um, garments and gear that are all, all enclosed, fully encapsulated, um, do elevate your core body temperature. So heat stress becomes a major challenge, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So basically moving forward, um, a lot of the, the research and development is looking at new materials that improve performance and breathability while also maintaining protection and looking at ways to manage heat stress. So in terms of heat management, current products uh, basically fall into three buckets. We have those that look at pre-cooling before you put on your gear and go into a situation. Um, then we've got the category of the operational cooling. So while you're engaged in an activity, how do you stay cool? And then that third bucket is physiological status monitoring. So looking at products like um, Fitbits and things like that, that can look at heart rates and other things that may be able to determine uh, body temperature, although not necessarily core body temperature. One of the major challenges is that all these technologies seem to focus on cooling the skin and not necessarily looking at other ways to decrease stress. Um, so in terms of future directions, um, you know, I mentioned uh, looking at how you understand core body temperature and the, and the elevation of that. So some research at the U.S. Army Institute of Environmental Medicine developed uh, the ECTEM algorithm, which actually can estimate core body temperature from heart rate. So this may be a way for an incident commander to monitor uh, his or her responders in the field and have a good idea of who may be in that danger zone in terms of heat. Um, and one other thing I want to mention in terms of future directions, looking at hydration status monitoring. There's been a lot of really nifty things in terms of sensors uh, being developed and looking at kind of non-traditional ways of uh, determining who may be at risk for heat stress. And we've actually worked here at HDI with some folks at the University of Cincinnati and also at Sandia National Laboratories looking at ways sensors can um, monitor interstitial fluid and sweat and look at electrolyte imbalance and also possibly be able to determine physiological status. And finally, the last part of responder protection is probably one of the most important is respiratory protection. Um, you can see the, the current products are available. Um, most of these haven't really changed. Um, once the filters are kind of developed in a place um, and if they're sufficient, there's not really much of a need to improve upon that. One of the big challenges though is, is that we saw in the report is mask interoperability. So, most masks are either geared towards positive or negative pressure and you have to be able to bring both because you don't know what kind of situation you're going to be in so having a mask that would have the parts that could go uh, both ways could be um, a big step in the right direction to to overcoming that challenge so search and rescue or SAR technologies are in many respects the core of what we typically imagine when discussing disaster response. These include everything from more traditional systems like radio communications to emerging technologies, including robots designed specifically for SAR operations. Recent efforts have improved even those technologies and systems that are currently available. Especially notable in this category is the public-private partnership between AT&T and the federal government that has built the First Responder Network Authority, or FirstNet. FirstNet is a nationwide broadband network designed to be especially durable to the effects of disasters and also used for priority access to first responders and other government officials. FirstNet is not meant to replace voice communications provided by land mobile radio systems, or LMRs, but to enhance the capabilities of data transfer and voice connection, data loads that, as discussed earlier, are growing exponentially every year. 
Looking forward, this slide presents a few examples of emerging technologies and practices useful to SAR operations. As with other areas of disaster response, machine learning is likely to play a central role. As with the advancement of personal protective equipment, as Greg just discussed, wearable technologies are also set to be a major contributor to improved responses. To focus on just one class of these emerging technologies, we'll look at robotics. Pictured is the Atlas Disaster Response Robot developed by DARPA. First unveiled in 2013, the robot has since been improved multiple times, and you likely saw on social media or on the news a recent video from just last month that showed the Atlas robot running and jumping fully over box obstructions. This sort of humanoid robot shows great promise for navigating the hazards of disaster environments that are simply too dangerous for human responders to enter. And a more recent DARPA robotics program, appropriately named SHRIMP, is building micro and even millisized robotics platforms, producing devices capable of entering tiny crevices and spaces that have typically been inaccessible to disaster response reconnaissance equipment. The next section focuses on supply chain management or logistics, and this is one of the more unique parts of the entire state of the art response or report. Um, and primarily because this is one of those topics where it's not necessarily driven by technology, it's driven by how we solve problems. And so we have three essential challenges in supply chain management, the facility location problem, goods transportation problem, and the inventory management problem. And no matter, what we're looking at, it's all about solving these problems, whether it's through really cool technologies like artificial intelligence or whether it's through better mathematical programming. So for an example of, of why it's so important to solve these challenges, um, during Hurricane Katrina, five helicopters were sent by five different agencies to rescue one person. And, and I'm sure there were multiple stories um, you know, that were very similar to that. So obviously that's a waste of resources um, if you're an incident commander or working in um, incident command tent you need to be able to know where all your resources are at one time um, and to prioritize those so having a situation like this obviously is, is a big waste of time and resources that could be better used somewhere else so looking ahead at some methodologies that we currently use in supply chain management mathematical programming simulation primarily with monte carlo analysis um, there's been some work looking at probability theory and statistics using artificial neural networks to calculate uncertainty. And then one that still uh, may not seem uh, very emerging technology based, but social science. This is still a very fundamental part of supply chain management. And there are five key elements to any good um, preparedness uh, response. And so we're looking at human resources, knowledge management, process management, resources in general in that community. And so how we can use social science to understand the interrelation between those five elements is a very important part of understanding logistics. And so these are four perspectives on the slide here, looking forward uh, for future research. And I just want to touch on two of these briefly. In terms of disaster relief issues for government organizations, uh, considering HDI is Department of Defense sponsored organization and many of you are DOD as well, um, it comes down to three things. IT system requirements, especially with all the social media that we see and the data overload that Joel mentioned. Looking at staffing needs, do we have the right people who can understand these um, really heavy algorithms and all of the IT heavy systems that we see now and also robotics and engineering do we have the right people who can understand not just how to build these but ma maintain them and use them during a response and also how these agencies co coordinate with other emergency management partners and then finally just wanted to touch on some of the upcoming challenges um, we've noticed that there seems to be a trend in understanding how to respond to urban disasters how to respond to disasters in developed countries where the cost of disasters are very high because the infrastructure tends to be very expensive to begin with. Uh, looking at response to conflict zones, so if we have a war zone such as Yemen or Syria, and if there were a major disaster, how would we respond in that environment? Looking at disasters that um, are 
technological disasters spurred by a natural event or NATEC disasters, as we call them, and also looking at events that reduce the authority of a local government. So, for example, uh, during the BP oil spill, the Coast Guard was heavily involved because that was an offshore operation. And so even though it affected many parishes in Louisiana, they didn't really have a lot to say because they didn't have the resources. How, how do we um, respond to those types of events? The United States has been fortunate not to have had any major radiological or nuclear emer emergencies in the homeland. Even so, the so-called rad nuke emergencies present challenges to responders and governments in the extreme. As the slide explains, a nuclear emergency involves those events that begin with a nuclear weapon, weapon detonation, a threat that DOD and DHS continually guard against and prepare for. A radiological emergency is defined to include all incidents that involve radioactive material but come from a non-nuclear device explosion incident. DOD's CBRN response enterprise contains multiple assets and means of responding to a rad nuke event. These include specialized incident command and control teams, and both CBRN and medically focused advisory and response teams with significant expertise and the technical facets of rad nuke emergencies. So in terms of response, we have two primary areas. First is the actual response itself. If you look at the figure on the right, uh, this is in reference to his own response. We tend to think of a, a nuclear event um, as a series of concentric circles where you have ground zero and then going out from there, um, you have different types of damage, you have different risks of radiation dose and things like that. So you can kind of see the resources and the severity um, that you have to deal with as you go out. You can also see that purple fuzzy area is the fallout zone. So depending on which way the wind is moving and if you're in a city or urban environment where you have buildings and things like that, you can kind of estimate where um, the fallout may be and you can look downstream in terms of how to respond. In terms of re uh, protection, uh, DHS adopted NFPA 472, which is the standard of competence for responders to hazardous materials, weapons of mass destruction incidents. So right now that is the standard in terms of what is used and needed uh, in responding to radiation and nuclear emergencies. And then looking down at decision making, there's been um, a couple updates primarily since uh, September 11th. One of them is the, the development of a position by DHS called the Radiological Operations Support Specialist or the ROS. Uh, the ROS is a subject matter expert in radiation and nuclear information. Um, and this is a position that can be integrated with incident command during a, a radiological or nuclear um, event. And also, Joel had briefly mentioned earlier about FirstNet, and this is a communication system that um, was approved in all 50 states in January of 2018 and is currently being rolled out across the United States. And then finally, we have another product um, called Rad Responder, which is actually uh, co-developed by FEMA, NNSA, and EPA. And this is a software that can help um, coordinate a lot of that radiation, uh, data and other types of resources during a radiation or nuclear event. And just briefly looking at future directions, um, in 2014, DARPA released their SIGMA program, which looks at how we can outfit responders in cities with uh, passive um, detectors. And, and SIGMA was specifically looking at radiological and nuclear detection. Uh, because that program has been so successful, DARPA has now um, release Sigma Plus, which is adding the biological, chemical, and explosives detector capability. So th this will be another uh, tool, if you will, uh, for uh, response going forward. And as we near the end of the presentation, we wanted to give you um, just a glimpse of where we go from here in terms of disaster response. So most of these technologies and methods that we covered in the report are things that are currently being used, maybe have been used for several years now. Um, and 
we tried to give you a little bit of a taste looking forward of what to expect over the next three to five years. So I wanted to just summarize those very briefly. So I, you know, I think that we all agree we'll continue to see an advancement of these technologies discuss the six categories that Joel mentioned at the beginning. We're also going to see an implementation of what I call a next wave of technology. If you look at the figure at the bottom, the dark blue circles are the technologies that we discuss in this report and highlighted in this presentation. The light blue ones, I think, are the ones that have the most promise that we're just starting to understand how they can benefit disaster response, and I think we'll continue to build on those. Third, this concept of uh, technological convergence. So how do we combine multiple technologies such as social media, artificial intelligence, drones, robotics to create even better tools? And we saw a little bit of that in this report, and I think we'll see more of that going forward. Number four, this overlap, overlapping of functions. So for example, there was a Norwegian organization called Sintef, which has developed a jacket that provides protection, but also has communications um, integrated into it. So while a first responder is wearing this, they can have the protection they need, but also talk into their sleeve to communicate uh, with other responders. We're also seeing this um, with social media as well. Uh, there is an app called FireChat, which is a social media tool, but it also um, acts as a mesh network so that anybody who has this app can talk to each other, even in the absence of uh, internet or Wi-Fi connections. And finally, as I mentioned before, we have seen a huge investment um, in responder protection since September 11th, and, and we continue to see that. Uh, Department of Homeland Security is investing heavily in developing what they call this next generation first responder. Uh, we have tools such as Audrey, the Assistant for Understanding Data through Reasoning, Extraction, and Synthesis, which is an AI-based tool that can help responders coordinate across various platforms. Um, and we're also seeing just a lot of people really investing in research and development to provide better tools and resources. And so DHS re released Project Responder 5 in 2017, which highlights 37 capability needs identified by the first responder community. And I think going forward, we'll continue to see how each of these 37 needs can be met. And then I'm sure we'll probably have a Responder 6 at some point. So as we segue into the end of the presentation, I want to give you a few moments to type in any questions you may have. Uh, we'll brief you a little bit on some of the additional services that HDIAC offers. So we offer a unique research support service that we call Technical Inquiry, or TI. HDIAC provides four free hours of analytical, scientific, and professional research on questions that fall within our eight focus areas. This service is available to academia, industry, and other government agencies. To initiate a request, please visit hdiac.org. HDIAC also offers a Core Analysis Task Contract Vehicle, or CAT. HDIAC CATs address challenging technical problems, including R&D, science and technology, and RDT and E issues that fall outside of our basic center of operations. The HDIAC CAT is pre-competed. So work can begin on a project in as little as six weeks once a statement of work is approved. CATs are customer funded and must be completed within 12 months. Finally, our external subject matter expert network is a critical tool in achieving this mission. And if you have expertise in one of our focus areas, we encourage you to apply. Our SMEs help us provide the military and government with the most up-to-date and cutting-edge information and innovations. Each of the external authors who contributed to this SOAR is an excellent example of a SME who we collaborate with often and eagerly and turn to for technical advice. And again, we just want to thank all of the authors who assisted us with this report and many of, of you are on the webinar today, so we appreciate your um, your support and your help with writing this report. As Joel mentioned, through our subject matter experts uh, network, we are able to do all of these things that we do, and so we can't do it without our SMEs and volunteers, so we appreciate your help. I also want to thank the uh, HDI publications team uh, for all of their dedication to this, uh, to the graphics and the editing and all of the stuff that goes into this that nobody gets to see. Um, so uh, thank you to everybody here who, who made this uh, report happen. 
So we have a clarification, in a, both from Donald Poncavar, and I'm sorry when I mispronounced your name there. Uh, first clarification, future Sigma development is being picked up by the DHS countering WMB office. And one question, all 50 states have subscribed to FirstNet for use by first responders, but what are DOD's plans, if any, to use that broadband capability? So, <clears throat> Donald, thank you for the, the comments on Sigma. I wasn't aware of that, so I appreciate it. Um, looking at broadband, I'm not sure if DOD um, has plans to specifically use FirstNet. They are working some, on some other broadband capability. Um, I'll have to go and check my notes, and I can get back with you offline if that's okay. But I know that there, there has been some R&D specifically into that, mainly in a tactical environment. So we have another question coming in that, we'll, that we will wait on. And... and I'll just, I'll respond to Chris. So Chris, thank you. You and your team really did an amazing job. We appreciate your help. It looks like that question went away. So here we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from Dan Regan. This may be a bit outside of the scope of the report, but are there efforts to track infectious diseases or develop PON, POC devices following a disaster? That's a good question. Um, that was a little out of the scope for this report, but um, agencies like CDC and DHS do look at, uh, there's this whole field of disaster epidemiology, so looking at infectious disease outbreaks that may occur following a disaster. Um, I can look on that and give you some more information. I, I bet there probably are some efforts. I just can't recall any off the top of my head. All right, well, without any further questions, um, we thank you very much for attending, and we encourage you to look at the full SOAR itself. Um, it's a rip-roaring good read, and again, we thank all of our contributors and authors who have uh, made this happen. Thank you all.